will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. For this reason I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. The word of our Lord. Jesus said the Spirit would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the coming judgment. So what does that mean and what difference can it make to us? A woman was driving her mother and taking a drive. When she went over to speed limit, her mother would give her a hard time. Well, she dismissed her mother's advice. But it wasn't long before a state trooper pulled her over and gave her a ticket. As the policeman was walking away, the woman complained to her mother that the officer could have at least let her off with a warning. And her mother turned and said, Honey, I gave you the warning. <laughs> he gave you the ticket. <laughs> I was in a Reader's Digest in 93. So in the text today, Jesus tells us that Part of the Spirit's job is to give us also a warning. For Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So, first I want to have you noticed who Jesus said the Spirit was going to convict. Who is the Holy Spirit supposed to convict? You, me, the world is what it is. So Jesus isn't taking, talking here about the Spirit convicting us, the followers of Christ. I mean, it's not that the Spirit wouldn't do that. We just already know about that. But that's not his focus. The Spirit was sent to convict the world, to convict the lost. He's come to convince the world of their need for Jesus Christ their need to be saved. Now why is that important? Well, let me give an example of a pastor that first was starting to preach. He guess you could call him a ball of fire. He knew his Jesus, he knew his Bible, he knew what was at stake. The pastor was determined to sell Jesus to anyone who would listen. And he was pretty good at it. He was good at selling Jesus, but then a few months later in his ministry, he worked for a long time with a couple, and he got them baptized into Christ. And then he never saw them again. It really upset this new pastor. He worked hard to get these people to make a commitment to Jesus, and they just walked away. That shouldn't have happened, he thought. 
But then he read this passage from John 16. When the Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And then the pastor realized why he'd failed. It had been all about him up to that point. He was the one trying to do the convicting. He didn't need the Spirit's help. He could do it all by himself. He knew how to sell Jesus. He knew how to manipulate people. After all, he'd been in sales for a couple of years before entering the pulpit. And he knew how it was done. But once this pastor realized that what the Spirit's job was, he changed, he began to relax. And from that time on, he did the witnessing and let the Spirit do the convicting. Convicting the lost was not his job and or ours. It's making sure people know how important Jesus is to, to us. So our job is to make people jealous of what God has done for us and what he means to us. Of course, the question is, how does that work? How do I let the Spirit do his thing and then me or you do mine or our thing? So let's break that down. First, Jesus said the Spirit would convict the world concerning sin. That means I don't have to lecture people about their sin. That's the Spirit's job. The Barna group back in April 2011, that's a group that does religious surveys. They found that fully one-third of American adults felt held back or defined by something in their past. About the same number of American adults have reported dealing with unresolved emotional conflict or some conflict in life. So in other words, a lot of people out there knew their sin and it was damaging them. They didn't need our help, yours or mine, to be told their lives were a mess. They already knew it. What they don't know is how to fix that. Now, if someone asks you, um, is cursing a sin? Well, yeah, probably. Is deceiving others or hurting others a sin? Yeah. You can tell people like stuff like that. And there's a lot of other things. But it doesn't do any good to nag non-Christians about their sins. That's the Spirit's job. God did not save us to play God or condemn others. Boy, we do that too much, don't we? Our job is to witness to them, not condemn them. Condemning folks is not your job or mine. Think about it. If someone is constantly nagging you about something you're doing or not doing, how likely would you change? You'd resist. Well, you might change at least while they're around, just to get them off your back. But once they're gone, you're not going to care because you didn't want to change to begin with. And their nagging just made you want to dig in your heels, right? <laughs> Sometimes it works that way on Facebook and other social media. A lot of Christians say mean and hateful things about politicians and other people they don't agree with. And it makes them feel good that they've taken a stand for righteousness. I kind of watch and wonder as in their opposition to sin, they nag the world with hatred and spite and declare their disgust with such stupidity, actually. But God says that's not going to work. God says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, James 1.20. So if you're posting mean-spirited stuff on Facebook or saying that to people, you might as well stop it. You're not doing God any favors. You are dragging the name of Jesus through the mud so you can feel better about yourself. It's not your job to do this kind of thing. It's the Spirit's job to convict people of their sin, not yours. And secondly, 
the Spirit came to convict the world concerning righteousness. Now, people sense the need for personal righteousness anyway, but their standard of righteousness is mostly based on their own righteousness, and they hope they can get God's approval through their self-righteousness. But Christian morality is based on Jesus' righteousness. That's why so many people oppose Christianity, because Christ's standards of righteousness is so much higher than theirs are. And that truth makes them uncomfortable. In John 3, 20, we're told, Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. And so the Spirit's job, and ours is to point to Jesus' righteousness, not our own. I once heard of a preacher who would advertise a special invitation to a meeting at the church building. He offered critics a chance to air all their objections to Christianity. Apparently 1,200 people showed up, and many of them were given a chance to come to the microphone and voice their criticisms. One man said, church members are no better than anyone else. Someone else said, the preachers are crooked. <laughs> the church is full of hypocrites. The church is only interested in your money. Well, there were 27 objections to Christianity in all. The preacher wrote them down on a piece of paper, and when the critics were through, the preacher stood up and read the entire list. Then he tossed the paper inside and said, Friends, you have objected to preachers, to church members, to bad congregations, but you have not said one word against the Master. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And then he began to preach about Jesus. He spoke of Christ's love, his righteousness, and he spoke of Jesus being the faultless Son of God. And he offered an invitation, and 49 people responded to it. Now what was that preacher's point? The point is this. He is not going to focus on the righteousness of Christians or preachers or churches. Instead, he was determined to focus entirely on Jesus and his righteousness. So you see that a major part of what the Spirit strives to do is to point people to the righteousness of Christ. Once people realize how righteous Jesus is, they realize they're not righteous enough and they need to be forgiven of their sins. Then lastly, the Spirit's job is to convict the world that there is a coming judgment. There will come a time of reckoning. You know, Thomas Jefferson, who wasn't particularly a godly man, said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. So even Thomas Jefferson felt conviction of the Spirit on this. Even he knew there was going to be a coming judgment. Notice the Spirit's job is not to make people feel good about themselves. Instead he focuses on convicting people that they are one, sinners, two, they're not righteous, and three, they will face judgment. Now the question is, where do we fit in? Where do we fit in? Well, you and I are critical to this in Romans 10, 14. It says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching or someone telling them? So notice Romans is saying that, that we believe because of the Spirit helps us. But that's not his job, the sharing. What is it saying? Sinners will believe because you told them, you tell them. If you don't tell people about Jesus Christ, they're not likely to know about Jesus and they will go you see, we do have a job, 
to tell people about Jesus or how he's affected our lives. That can be our story. But we're not doing it alone, of course, because Jesus says the Spirit is our helper. The Spirit's job is to help us by setting people up for you and I to witness to them. You could say the Spirit primes the pump for you and I to share about Jesus. Now, how does the Spirit do that? Well, sometimes he convicts people through Scripture. In Acts 8, God sent Philip to witness to a government official in Ethiopia, known as the Ethiopian eunuch. As Philip, Philip approaches the eunuch, guess what this guy is reading? Scripture. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch responds, no, how can I, unless someone explains it to me. Now, do you think it was an accident the man was reading the Bible? No. The Spirit already had been working in this man's life, setting the man up for Philip to witness to him. And notice Philip just asked, do you understand it? Now, Philip's been to Sunday school. He knows how to answer the man's questions. He sits down beside the eunuch to explain what Isaiah has been talking about. And right in the middle of the Bible study, the eunuch sees some water off on the side of the road and cries, look, there's water. What prohibits me from being baptized? So Philip and the Ethiopian make their way down to the water and the eunuch is baptized right out there in the middle of nowhere. And when it's all done, the Ethiopian goes on his way rejoicing. Second, sometimes the Spirit sets people up for you through circumstances. In Acts 16, we read that Paul and Silas have been arrested for preaching and they're thrown in jail. They spend the night praying and singing praises to God when all of a sudden there's this earthquake and all the jail doors swing